Well, welcome human biology class. Uh, we're um, going to move to um, the second lecture in the respiratory system today. Um, last time we left off uh, looking at the upper respiratory system parts, nose, the sinuses, the nasal pharynx, the larynx, the trachea. Uh, if you remember, we were paying attention to the amount of cartilage uh, in the tubes that lead into the lung. The trachea is mostly cartilage. Uh, it's a rigid tube that prevents it from collapsing uh, so that uh, your body would not be able to get air. That, that is, is prevented by having a rigid tube. But as these tu the tube descends into your lungs and branches, the amount of cartilage will become less. The amount of smooth muscle will become more. And smooth muscle is um, the kind of muscle that uh, you don't think about. It it's, uh, functions beyond your conscious control, largely. And so um, things can trigger smooth muscle to contract, and when it does so, um, if it's surrounding an airway, for instance, the opening in the middle of the airway can uh, shrink in response to that contracted muscle and, uh, and lead to breathing difficulties. So um, the function of... Um, the uh, wall of the tubes uh, will change as we descend into the lungs. At any rate, we stopped last time right about here talking about the primary bronchi, bronchi, uh, bronchi and um, how they're made up of a combination of cartilage and smooth muscle. And I was talking about I'd like there to show, show a little more muscle, a little more reddish tissue here, but that's fine. Um, so now, now we're going to um, think about being in the lungs. And really, it's the, the lungs are defined. It gets a little bit arbitrary, but all all this tissue that be, that's below the primary bronchi. So here's a bronchi, and here's a bronchi. Everything below those two, you know, where, where those bronchi begin to branch, is considered lung. And um, and of course, uh, the right lung is a little larger than the left lung, because right about in here is where your heart sits, of course. And um, you can re this shows up really well if the heart were here. Uh, it's a close association with the diaphragm and with the stomach right below it and why um, we can call stomach uh, discomfort heartburn because it is so close to the heart. Well, the lungs are right here too. And so to accommodate the heart, there's less lung on your left side than there is on your right side. And this is commonly referred to as one less lobe. Um, I, I don't know if that's it's entirely uh, missing a, a lobe, but certainly there's less lung on the left than there is on the right to accommodate the heart. Um, the lungs are covered with pleura, and um, I want to show you uh, an image. Uh, it, it's difficult to um, really uh, show you pleura because it's such a fine material. Um, please pardon the labeling on this image. It's good enough that I think I wanted to use it anyway. Um, pleura is, is, I've used this analogy before when we were talking about mesentery and uh, uh, um, tissues in the abdominal cavity. Pleura is, is, again, one of those tissues that's very much like cellophane. It's a very fine, thin covering on, on in this case, the lungs. And there are really two layers of pleura. There's a layer that's right on the lung. That's this layer that's right here. This would be lung. And this would be a layer of pleura. And then there's another layer right here. And this would be right on the wall of the thoracic cavity, your chest cavity. So there's these two layers of pleura, cellophane-like material, with a space in between. And that, that needs to be lubricated because, of course, the lungs are going to move relative to the wall of your thoracic cavity every time you breathe in and breathe out. So there's this, this lubricated surface, if you will, that the lungs can move against uh, when you breathe. And that's, that's a really good thing. Um, there's, uh, there can be an, a bacterial infection of, of the pleura. It's called pleurisy. Uh, you may have heard, heard of that particular um, ailment. Um, there's another, probably in this day and age, more common uh, ailment. I'm going to try to play a YouTube clip. I hope I don't get flagged for it again. Uh, if I do, I will remove it. I can't do that too many times or it'll stop letting me make videos. So, um, Here is uh, a commercial that you may uh, commonly see um, on the TV. Or not. Attention. If you were a loved one was diagnosed with mesothelioma, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Okay, so um, I'm wondering if, if you've seen that commercial. Uh, if you have, mesothelioma 
is uh, um, an ailment. Uh, there are a number of, of variations of mesothelioma, uh, but largely um, the one that the commercial is referring to is a cancerous um, growing or growth of, of the pleura here. And, and so um, if, you, if you think about how, how difficult it would be to operate on that, um, yeah, it's a big deal. Now, th that can also be a cancer of the pericardium, uh, the sac around the heart, uh, or in the abdomen, the peritoneum. Um, uh, but, but largely, it's this, it occurs here because a person uh, may have breathed in asbestos. Uh, you've probably heard of various issues with asbestos. There are uh, problematic forms of asbestos and, and not so problematic forms of asbestos. Actually, the, the benches in our lab are made of, an, uh, of a fairly inert form of asbestos. That really isn't a problem. It's that stuff that uh, becomes airborne um, that was used for insulation. That's the problem. And there were mines, particularly in Montana, that had uh, that were, were mining through asbestos-laden rock where the workers would breathe that in. And so what happens is those asbestos fibers um, uh, get caught up in the, uh, the, the pleura the, that lines the lungs, and it would uh, uh, sort of mess with the DNA and, and turn off um, the cells that are in the pleura, the cell's ability to basically stop um, uh, cancerous growth. Um, and, and so there's a, a, a gene, a DNA uh, inhibiting tumor suppressing, uh, or a, a tumor suppressing gene uh, that would be inhibited in the DNA that's in these pleural cavities. And so, um, uh, you know, a person would develop cancer there then. That's one of the, that's the main problem with asbestos. Well, can you imagine how difficult it would be to operate on cellophane on such a thin, how would you stitch it? It would just come apart. It, it's a very difficult cancer to beat for, for a number of reasons, not the least of, uh, of them being difficult to, to surgically address. Uh, but me, that's what mesothelioma is. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's such a common uh, ailment that I thought I would mention it. Another one that I wanted to talk about is a collapsed lung. And um, if I go back to, well actually, here, I'll show you, here's another look at this is a, a human body, if you will, cut, cut in half. Um, and and uh, this is a layer of, of uh, pleura here. And then they've got another layer uh, lined here. Um, this is also important when considering a collapsed lung. Because a collapsed lung is when air leaks in between the two layers of pleura. Oops. Air leaks in here. And um, it, it reduces the lung's ability to expand and take in gases. So if we um, go back to my old friend Wikipedia, really some excellent images on there. Here's, here's a look at uh, what uh, a collapsed lung might look like. Now, folks, this, is, this can be due to an injury, uh, blunt force trauma, but uh, you know it's also not uncommon just to have a person walking around and all of a sudden they'll um, get an air leak between their pleura and form an air bubble between the two layers of pleura and have a collapsed lung. It, it's unfortunately quite common in tall, thin males. Uh, for some reason, because of their, their, their makeup, um, they're uh, more susceptible to having a collapsed lung. This is an artist's rendition of what it looks like. So now there's an air space here around the lung that the lung cannot expand into. And this is what it looks like, again, on a cross-section of a human body. So this is normal lung material, and uh, this is a collapsed lung right here. And so what has to happen is a tube has to be placed in there. Now, they won't do that right away. There's, there's a chance that it could self-correct, but, but usually um, a, a, a tube will be placed in. So here, here's the person's back. A tube will be placed in the side or the chest and drain that air out and uh, let the lung reestablish its normal shape. And uh, it takes, you know, it's a fairly painful procedure, and it takes a little bit to get that to happen. Um, my, my wife was, uh, we, we do a mountain bike race uh, in my hometown of Cable every fall. And uh, my wife being a nurse, I, I, I bet probably at least easily a third, maybe a half of the, of the 20, 30 years she's done that race, she's had to stop to help somebody that's crashed and hurt themselves. And one year she um, stopped for a gentleman that had crashed hard, and, uh, well, actually, tw two years. Um, first year, um, dude's there having difficult breathing, difficulty breathing. 
he had he had cracked a lung and it had penetrated the pleura and uh, was taking on oxygen or taking on air between the lungs and one lung had completely collapsed and he was having difficulty staying conscious as, as blood filled that ca that cavity. Another time another another person had crashed um, having difficulty breathing probably again a broken lung but any or broken uh, rib but at any rate uh, definitely a collapsed lung and uh, a couple of uh, uh, ER docs came along, and uh, this person was really uh, getting into ha having problems. They were worried they were going to lose him. And uh, and these these people, my my wife, another nurse, had stopped these two doctors. They're actually sitting out there in the woods looking for a sharp stick that they can shove into the guy's chest uh, to try to relieve that pressure to allow him to live. Um, and they actually didn't have to do that, of course, which is a good thing. But that's how how severe um, these can become. So that's a collapsed lung. Uh, when air sneaks between the two layers of pleura right here and um, reduces the area that a lung can uh, expand into. Okay, so um, a couple of structural pieces of information about the lung, a couple of uh, ailments that come along with it. Um, if you're looking along in your notes, I'm on number seven there. Um, we talk about the lung being able to hold from 5,000 to 6,000 milliliters of air. So if you can think of a two-liter pop bottle, uh, two and a half to three of those on average. Um, Endurance-trained athletes uh, actually can increase their their lung capacity, um, and and so they're and, and of course very sedentary people won't breathe as much. So there are there are very uh, variations that are possible, but that's an average. Um, and so if you look in your textbook. Um, uh, the image is there. I'm going to reference this one. Um, when one studies the function of the lung, there are some points that are, are important. One, if we look at this chart, there is an amount of air that you can't breathe out of your lungs. You can't exhale it. And that's so it's just kind of like uh, keeping the walls of a balloon from sticking together. You want a little air in the system to keep the, 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 the system open, if you will. Um, there is this term tidal volume. The tide, I know I'm, I'm not quite in order with the notes, but uh, that's okay. I think you can handle that. The tidal volume is the amount of air you're exchanging with your environment as you're just sitting, hopefully where you are right now, at rest. And that's about 500 milliliters on, a, uh, on average. Okay, so you're not exchanging a lot of air because you don't have a, not, a lot of demand, a lot of need to. You're not working hard right now. You're hopefully cognitively working hard, but not physically. So that's your tidal volume, just the amount of air you exchange with your environment at rest. Um, then there is that amount, if you, if you take a breath, just normal breathing, okay, not even thinking about it. If you get to the bottom of a breathing cycle, you can, you can forcibly breathe out some air. Okay? That's your expiratory reserve, vo reserve volume. To, to exp uh, uh, expiratory means what you can breathe out. Okay, so, so you're sitting there just comfortable, breathing in and out, get to the bottom of an exhalation, just before you start to breathe in, stop, breathe a little more air out. That, that's that, that amount. Well, and then similarly, as you're sitting there, um, there's an amount of air that um, you can breathe in. Um, well, not, if you're, not as you're sitting there, but say you get out and you, you work out really, really hard. You put a big demand on the system. And you would go from that tidal volume to all this air that you can breathe in and breathe out, exchange with your environment if you need to. So this amount, inspiratory reserve volume and expiratory reserve volume, plus your tidal volume, is the total amount of air that you can exchange with your environment should you need to. And then there's always this residual volume, that portion that you can't uh, exchange. So this amount that you can exchange is called vital capacity. The amount that you can't is called um, the residual volume. All right, so I'm hoping to make you all sort of lightheaded and tingly-headed here if, you, if you're following along with me and doing some of these things. Okay, so then uh, number eight in your notes, we've, gone, we've talked some about the lungs. We'll keep talking about them. We're, we're descending down into the lungs now and looking at some parts of the lungs. Bronchioles um, are, are a part of the lung. And I'm going to switch to another picture here um, from your textbook. And um, there, there, this portion right here, this, this tube right here, is, is a bronchiole. 
and and really there shouldn't be any white on it at all. There's there's no cartilage in the bronchioles. They're all smooth muscle, uh, pretty much all smooth muscle. But at the end of them, they're kind of like a stalk on a grapevine. At the end of that stalk are clusters that looks like grapes. The clusters, each grape would be uh, analogous to uh, a, a, an alveoli. That that's this little bubble-like portion that you see here. Okay, and and they're clusters of air sacs. And also really important to notice here, each one of them is covered by a capillary bed, red indicating an artery bringing blood in, blue indicating a vein bringing blood out. Um, or you might think, yeah, well, that's there's a little bit of a of a color problem there, but that's that's okay. Um, at any rate, um, that's the alveoli. Uh, this is where gas exchange occurs, and there's some common misconceptions with this. Every time you breathe, you don't completely empty your lungs, what you can, and take in new air. In actuality, every time you breathe, you only exchange about 10% of the volume of gas in your lungs with your environment. Only about 10% is exchanged. Um, so oxygen, the, uh, the point of it is to get oxygen into these uh, um, air sacs and to kick CO2 out of these air sacs. And I think, yeah, there's this picture. Uh, I'll get to that in just a second here. So um, that's going on here. Now there's a common, another common misconception uh, in addition to the fact that we don't exchange all of the capacity with our lungs every time we breathe, only 10%. But the other thing is that um, when, we, when we breathe in, the um, oxygen uh, that we breathe in um, leaves the red blood cells and that uh, CO2 uh, um, is picked up by the red blood cells. I, I shouldn't say that's an error, but there's, there's a lot more detail to it. Now I'll go to this picture here. So right here, this is the alveoli. Maybe I'll, yeah, that'll, that'll work. So this is the alveoli. So this is the air sac, and this is a capillary, okay? Now, um, remember, there are capillaries that uh, are the same size or even a little smaller than the blood cells so that the blood cell has to actually taco over and squeeze through it. And that makes all this surface area of the blood cell touch this wall of the capillary and makes exchange of gases uh, more efficient. So, yep, um, oxygen comes in. Okay, right here, oxygen. This is the alveoli. Oxygen comes in and is picked up by the hemoglobin molecule on the red blood cell. But here, if we look here, the CO2 doesn't take the same path. Yeah, maybe a small a, a, a bit of CO2 is carried on the hemoglobin in the red blood cell, but most of it is carried on the carbonic acid bicarbonate molecule. Now, if you remember from way back, um, this goes on in our body all the time. CO2 merges with water, joins with water, forms carbonic acid, which is a weak acid, doesn't hang around long, um, breaks apart or dissociates into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. And, uh, and this bicarbonate is an acid buffer, and the carbonic acid was the base buffer in our bodies. But you'll notice in both these molecules, there's a CO2 here. It, here's a carbon, and there's, there's three oxygens. So you could break that apart, and you would have CO2. Uh, here again, there's a C, and there's definitely two oxygens here. You break that apart, and you've got a CO2. So some of the CO2, actually most of the CO2 in your body, is carried in the red blood cell, but not on the hemoglobin molecule, as either carbonic acid or bicarbonate. And that's what is showing up right here. That's what they're trying to show you right here. And maybe I'll blow that up a little bit. We see a little bit better. Okay, so um, there's the bicarbonate ion. Um, enters the red blood cell, um, becomes car uh, carbonic acid, breaks apart into water and CO2. CO2 goes into the alveoli and out of our bodies. Okay, so so yeah, that's how it happens. Now, interestingly enough, y'all know it's not a good idea to bring breathe in exhaust, and and the the problem is because of carbon monoxide. That's just CO. Carbon monoxide actually binds to the hemoglobin molecule like 200 times more tightly than oxygen. You see, your body doesn't want the oxygen to bind tightly to the hemoglobin molecule or it would be hard to give it up um, to the tissues. When this is carried out into the tissues, 
your body wants to be able to get that oxygen away from the hemoglobin easily so it's not bound tightly. Carbon monoxide will bind tightly to the hemoglobin molecule and when it does so there's no place for the oxygen molecule to bind. That's why carbon monoxide is bad. You keep breathing it in pretty soon your blood cells carry no oxygen and the person dies of oxygen deprivation or starvation if you will. Okay that little diatribe was uh, about the alveoli. Um, it's, it's a big deal. Um, there, there has to be uh, in this whole system um, a substance called a surfactant. Um, no matter where we are in the system, a surfactant, actually I, I should probably have the alveoli up here uh, predominantly because this, it's a big deal there. Uh, again, keep the walls from sticking together and surfactant does that. It's a slippery mucousy like substance that um, helps prevent that and we're going to look at that when we get to some of the uh, ailments uh, such as uh, cystic fibrosis that can affect the respiratory system. So remember that, surfactant. It's there in your notes under alveoli. Um, at any rate, breathing. So thinking about breathing then, uh, I, I wasn't the most thrilled with this. Maybe this will work. This, eh, we'll go to another one. This image will work well. If I'm in class, I've got a glass container with a rubber membrane in it that I can pull and it will inflate and deflate a, a balloon inside of it. Um, how do you do that uh, this way? I, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, maybe I should have gone and taken a video of it. Um, at any rate, let's see what we can do with the images from your textbook. So we've talked about this a bit before. When you breathe in, what happens? Well, right here in this one, the rib cages, the ribs move up and out, and these intercostal muscles, these muscles between the ribs, help that to happen. They'll pull this rib up that way and the one below it up that way. Those, so your ribs will move up and out and your diaphragm right here will move down. And that's why when you take a deep breath, remember your stomach and spleen are right here, it's pushing those down. So when you take a deep breath, you're pushing your abdominal organs down. And uh, um, that's also why uh, uh, men can get a hernia, because there's a hole. If you remember the inguinal canal from the pig dissection, it's a hole, two holes in the bottom of the abdominal cavity, uh, through which the vas deferens, the spermatic cord, descend. Well, if you put a lot of pressure on those abdominal organs, boom, you're going to push some of them down into that inguinal canal and make a hernia. That's one way you can have it happen. At any rate, uh, so the lungs move up and out, the diaphragm moves down, that expands the, the, the size of the thoracic cavity, and just like opening a, a, a bag really rapidly, air will rush into it because you've created a void. If the bag is collapsed, if the walls are close to each other, the volume inside the bag is little, but as you pull the bag apart, you create a greater volume inside the bag and air rushes in to fill that volume. Um, conversely, you can forcibly exhale. You don't have to think about it to exhale, but you can. It's kind of one of those um, either or situations. And when you're just sitting there naturally breathing, you don't think to exhale. Your, your, your body's doing it automatically. But if you're uh, exercising heavily or you inhale something stinky and you want to get it out of there, then you can forcibly exhale. You can make those ribs move down. You can make the diaphragm move up and you can purge or exhale all the air or a lot of the air um, out of the lungs and, and get it out of there. Okay, so breathing has, um, that, so, so breathing uh, is caused because air is moving from low pressure moving into low pressure and we talked about that relative to the Dead Sea how that's easier there because there's so much atmosphere sitting on top of a person that more air rushes in faster into the lung cavity when the ribs move up and the diaphragm moves down. In your notes then the last part for today is um, breathing that has two parts inspiration which is active and expiration. And um, inspiration uh, is basically triggered by a rise of CO2, and it's active because you have to expend energy to do it, okay? Um, your body senses a rise of CO2 and or hydrogen ions in the blood. H plus, remember, that's, that's acid because CO2 will combine with water to form carbonic acid. Um, remember this, this one right here. Um, CO2. CO2 plus water forms carbonic acid. <clears throat> That's happening in your body all the time. When the amount of CO2 and the amount of um, um, hydrogen ion 
uh, get high, your body senses that and wants to get that out. So that stimulates the breathing center in your lower brain, uh, brain stem, and, and you exhale. Um, I'm guessing you've all heard of hyperventilation. I wanted to just spend just a minute talking about that. Hyperventilation is rapid, deep breathing. Um, it can be uh, caused by an injury, a panic attack, startle, surprise. You might know somebody that's done it, but they're just <sighs> breathing really hard. And what I normally do in class right now is I have you all breathe really hard, as deep as you can, in and out, 10 times, just really hard, really fast. And usually, before we even get to 10, so I want you to do that right now if you can. Okay, one, two, three. <sighs> Boy, that's a strange sound, probably. If you do that 10 times, hopefully you have, um, you'll start to feel a tingly sensation, a lightheadedness, a faintness. Well, what are you doing? When you're breathing deeply, you're purging CO2 out of your system more than you need to have leave your system. So if CO2 is leaving the system, your body can't make carbonic acid which remember, it wants some in there, but not too much. Not too little, not too much. Maintain a pH between 7.35 and 7.45. If you breathe too deeply, your body has not, does not have the ability to produce an acid, which it wants a little of, and so your blood pH rises too high. And that affects calcium availability, which affects your muscles, among other things. And it, and it affects the nerves, it affects your nerves, that's why you get the tingly sensation. We're going to find that calcium, boy, I've harped on this before, important in heartbeat, important in bones, important all over your body, important in blood clotting. Well, it, it you have to have the right amount of calcium for your nerves to function correctly. If you dump a bunch of CO2 out by breathing too deeply, calcium's not going to be available, your nerves aren't going to function correctly, and you're going to have a tingly sensation, chiefly in your appendages, and you're going to feel lightheaded. That is typical of CO2. What's the cure if a person is, uh, that is typical of hyperventilation. The cure, if a person is hyperventilating, have them breathe into a brown paper bag. You know what? That's not an old wives tale. That works. What are they doing? Well, if they breathe into a brown paper bag repeatedly, don't take it away from their face, they're going to continue, they're going to fill that bag up with CO2, but they're going to breathe that CO2 right back in. And they're going to establish normal CO2 levels in the blood. And pretty soon, all, this, all the issues that come along with hyperventilation will subside. <clears throat> and the person will feel better again. Hopefully, they haven't passed out. So, that's hyperventilation. And it's all about blood pH. And you can do that, again, if you breathe in 10 times really fast, um, you can get an initial sensation of what that would feel like. Okay, the last thing today then is expiration. Not a lot to say about that. It's passive. There's sort of an elasticity to your thoracic cavity. So when you expend energy for your to move your ribs up and your diaphragm down, you don't have to expend really any energy to breathe out. They sort of elastically rebound, and um, and and it's a relaxation of those muscles. But you can. Force, you can make you can burn energy doing that and forcibly exhale and we've already made that case all right so um, that's where we're going to stop there next time we're going to talk about uh, some diseases uh, including uh, coronavirus uh, associated with the respiratory system and um, have a good day